Our gut was telling us, our conversations with both kids and lawmakers and parents and, and folks who run after school programs, it was telling us that some of the true threats to children were by children themselves. And so while we know that there are the stranger danger concerns that still exist, we also recognize, just as in the offline world, uh, as, as is the case in the offline world, the online world too, that these that the threats that are coming to kids, like Ostwig said, it's, it's at-risk kids. At-risk kids who are, are at risk offline are also at risk online. And it's not the stranger danger fears. The conversation has really evolved to what type of information kids are putting out about themselves, uh, what type of information kids are putting out about other kids. It's the online harassment, um, the insults, the sexting, the cyberbullying. And so we were really thrilled uh, in some ways, if, if, you can, if that's the right word, uh, to see that there was some actual um, research that was being done in this arena because what we were seeing in the last couple of years is a lot of states jump uh, to sort of a one approach fits all policy, especially when it comes to cyberbullying. If you look back in the last couple of years, 2008, there were only a dozen states that had some sort of cyberbullying law on the books just two years ago. If you look today, almost every state has some, some law on the books. And while schools are, are wanting to, to address these issues, they recognize that cyberbullying is a true threat to some kids, uh, and, and they want to address them. Uh, you know, when you've got state lawmakers telling schools, we want you to do something, and this is what we want you to do, no matter what your situation is, then we run into a real problem. And from my organization, you know, it's really been sort of an interesting debate to, to become involved in, because we are a group that fights for tougher penalties uh, for sexual predators. When an adult is preying on on a kid, we expect some serious consequences to take place. But when we look at issues like cyberbullying, this isn't the same type of, of criminal penalties uh, that should be put into place. We're talking about young girls who are 14 to 17 primarily who are, are insulting one another. It's the Mean Girls viral, right? I mean, it's such a great movie, you know? Who knew that uh, Tina Fey would, would have so many accolades all these years later in, in that particular role? Uh, and, and so, you know, we started looking at what are the states doing? We attend a lot of conferences. We work in the states. We work to train lawmakers and law enforcement on what's going on in our schools and, and the communication that, that kids are having. And, and we find, not surprisingly, although it's definitely surprising to this group, that a lot, a lot of lawmakers don't understand the technology. They don't understand what kids are actually doing online, what they're using the technology for. And so they're jumping into these laws. You know, I started, I was reviewing some of the laws uh, in the 44 states that, that now have a cyberbullying policy. And, and for the most part, you know, some of them say, oh, a school needs a policy to address cyberbullying. Okay, right? I mean, we have bullying just like we had it on the playground in the offline world. You know, we address that when, when necessary. And of course, those same types of standards and expectations should apply online. But then you start looking uh, and, and uh, you get into Vermont, for instance. Jennifer and I were having this conversation before our panel started. And Vermont has imposed a $500 fine for anyone caught cyberbullying. Well, you know, what are you supposed to do with that? What does that mean? You know, so, so, so some 14-year-old girl's parents had to pay a $500 fee to the school because her daughter was saying something mean about someone else. When we are talking about online harassment, when we are talking about some sort of predation, even if it is by a child and when there are, are serious criminal consequences and they, they are, you know, they are the stories where you've got these, um, some of these young kids committing suicide or they're afraid to go to school, they're intimidated uh, to get onto a school bus. Those are serious issues and they need to be addressed, but addressed with seriously. But for the most part, we're talking about kids who are mean to one another online and charging their parents $500 because they insulted someone just doesn't seem to really move the debate forward. Uh, Louisiana has a pending law right now, a pending legislation that they're looking at making first-time offense of cyberbullying a misdemeanor. In theory, the intent, probably it's good. You know, they're looking at it saying, oh, we've got these terrible cases and these, our kids are, are fearful and they can't come to school and, and they're depressed and they're, you know, their entire social world is, is changing and, and uh, uh, we need to do something about it. That intent is good, but criminalizing a 14-year-old uh, for saying something mean probably isn't the best approach. We need to really look at education and when you look at these 
these reports, that's what came out of it, and that's what's so promising to see. Uh, you know, I, it probably gets tiring to hear education, 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 but it is so true, and it's parents, and it's school teachers, and it's after-school programs, it's kids themselves talking about these issues, trying to figure out what's really going on in their life, uh, what's going on in their online world, and teaching them to become better digital citizens. Uh, and you, can, you can't legislate social norms. Uh, you know, we get a lot of pushback from the schools who say, okay, well, we have this cyberbullying policy in effect. We don't know how to enforce it. We don't really know what enforcement means. We have no idea once the child has been either bullied or doing the bullying themselves, what happens to that kid? Are they suspended? Are they expelled? When they come back to school, then what happens? And there are a lot of questions that are, that are still sort of out there. We're looking... Um, I'm involved with another organization uh, called the Safe Internet Alliance, and we're looking at pr trying to provide some research, working with teachers to try to answer some of those questions so that we can look at what should be best practices for cyberbullying. But for now, we know that education is key, and we know that it has to start at home. Uh, a lot of schools are, are complaining, saying, you know, you're asking us to look at free speech issues. You're asking us to look at cyberbullying when, when, when most cyberbullying instances, of course, don't happen at school. If you're talking about a computer or a cell phone, uh, it's happening at home. It's happening on a weekend after school hours. And so you're asking schools to step in. And a lot of schools are saying, look, we, we just can't do this. We don't have the authority. We may not want to have the authority. There's a difference when, uh, you know, in, in some instances, a, a kid calls into the school and, and has a, a bomb threat, you know, calls in a bomb threat. The school has to be able to take that threat seriously. And they have to have procedures in place because they need to protect the kids who are in the school or who are on their way to, to coming to school and make sure that they're having a safe environment in in which to be educated. The same applies for cyberbullying. So there are those instances where the school needs to be involved. But we're saying, look, lawmakers, we need to sort of take a step back and review these policies before we start throwing our 14-year-old girls in jail uh, for something that, that you know, happens on the playground every day. Uh, you know, Pew has some really terrific research out there, and they interviewed a, a bunch of, of, um, of uh, teenagers. And you know, yes, we know that about 30% or so, it depends on what study you look at, uh, that, that they have received some sort of insult online. Now, some don't care. Some some walk away, it doesn't matter. Some take that very much to heart. But most teenagers still say that, that the majority of bullying still happens on the playground or at recess or in person. And so we just want to make sure that lawmakers are taking a step back and not having a sort of one size fits all approach and that we are able to work in the schools and work at home uh, to educate parents and, and teens about being uh, uh, digital citizens. And at this point, uh, you know, Mike, I just have to ask you, what's the best way to prevent uh, cyberbullying? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a teenage girl. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we really are talking about teenage girls here, you know, and so we need to keep this in, in perspective and, and, of course, take it seriously uh, when, when a line is crossed and, and when it does turn into online harassment or, or any kind of intimidation. We're going to give teenage girls equal time. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm supposed to be 